Erica here with Prop Scholar to GRE. Here today to teach you how to beat GRE quantitative comparison questions. If you like this video, subscribe for more great content and check us out at gre.prepscholar.com to learn more about what Prep Scholar GRE can do for you. There are typically 15 quantitative comparison questions on any given GRE exam. With only 40 quant questions, this means that about 38% of GRE quant questions are quantitative comparison. So this question type accounts for more than a third of your quant score. That's a lot. So it's important that we master this question type. Unfortunately, quantitative comparison is a particularly weird question type. Here are the basics. Each quantitative comparison question has the same structure. First, we have the question stem. The question stem provides us background information for the problem that we can assume to be true. The question stem can take many forms. It may be a sentence or sentences. It may be an equation. It may be a diagram. It may be some combination of the three. Sometimes, when the problem requires no background information, there is no question stem at all. Then, we have two quantities, labeled quantity A and quantity B. Quantity A will always appear on the left, while quantity B will always appear on the right. Like the question stem, a quantity can take many forms. It may be a number, a variable, an expression, a phrase, etc. Finally, each question has the same four answer choices, of which we can only choose one. Quantity A is greater, quantity B is greater, the two quantities are equal, and the relationship cannot be determined from the information given. So the goal of any given quantitative comparison question is first to determine whether or not we can determine the relationship between quantity A and quantity B, and second, if we can determine the relationship, to do so. So why would the test ask us to do this? This isn't how we normally test math. Why can't we stick to five answer multiple choice questions where one answer choice is correct? The reason is that these questions don't really test math. In fact, none of the questions on the quant section do. The GRE uses math, vocabulary, etc. as a foundation to test higher level skills like critical reasoning, the things that grad schools and future employers actually care about. Quantitative comparison questions test a couple things specifically. One is determining the value of information to making decisions. We get a limited amount of information in the question stem and quantities. It's up to us to figure out whether it's enough information to solve. Another is avoiding and testing assumptions, specifically by finding edge cases. A set of quantities that might be equal if we know that x is positive may not be equal if we consider that x may be negative. One quantity may be greater than the other in all cases, except when y equals 0. Have we considered what would happen if n were a fractional value between 0 and 1? And so on. The closest analog these questions have is data sufficiency on the GMAT. In fact, if you're looking for more advice on these questions, look into suggestions for data sufficiency. The most useful strategies are transferable between the question types. The first step in beating quantitative comparison questions is to spend enough time with the question stem. Now, sometimes you won't get a question stem, which means there is nothing to spend time with. However, most of the time, the question stem will contain the scenario the problem focuses on. This scenario is never presented as simply as possible, so taking the time to work through what the question gives us, what that really means in terms of our problem, and what else we can determine based on that information gives us a good foundation on which to interpret the quantities. For instance, in this question, we get a diagram and a sentence. The diagram shows a circle with an inscribed triangle in which one angle is 60 degrees. The sentence tells us that O is the center of the circle and that the perimeter of the triangle is 6. Okay, what can we do with this information? Can we make it more easily usable? Well, if we know that O is the center of the circle and that points A and B are on the circle, triangle sides AO and BO are both radii of the circle. This means that the two sides must be the same. Okay, well, what can we do with that information? If AO and BO are the same length, then angles A and B must be the same measure. The sum of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees, and angle O is 60 degrees, so angles A and B must add up to 120 degrees. If both angles are the same measure, this means that A and B both measure 60 degrees, the same as angle O. Since all three angles have the same measure, 
This means AOB is an equilateral triangle. Okay, well, what can we do with that? If AOB is an equilateral triangle, then all three sides are the same length. If the perimeter of the triangle is six, then each side must have a length of two. We already determined that AO and BO are radii of the circle, so the radius of the circle must be two. What can we do with that? Well, a lot of things. With the radius of a circle, we can find diameter, circumference, area, etc. Now at this point, we've probably seen that quantity A deals with the circumference of the circle. So we know that's what we should solve for and then compare to 12. And that's it. The second step in beating quantitative comparison questions is to manipulate the quantities themselves. Like the question stem, the quantities are rarely given in an easy to work with format. Often students forget that they can use math to simplify the quantities and resign themselves to blind guessing. Don't be that guy. Use algebraic concepts to take the quantities to their simplest forms, utilizing the information from the question stem. This will either lead you directly to the answer or allow you to more easily determine what kinds of numbers you want to test. For instance, in this question, quantity B is just eight. Not much we can do with that. But quantity A should be recognizable to us as a difference of squares. It takes the form A squared minus B squared where a is x and b is 2y. We can rewrite any difference of squares as a minus b times a plus b. This means that we can rewrite quantity a as x minus 2 times x plus 2. Looking at our question stem, we see exactly that, and it equals 4. So quantity a is 4, which is clearly less than quantity b. Which leads us to the third step in beating quantitative comparison questions. Plug in numbers to an extent. Test takers love to plug in numbers on quantitative comparison, but it's actually a pretty risky strategy. Most numbers aren't going to tell us much about the problem at hand, and many test takers end up plugging in 10 different numbers that tell them the same thing, while missing the one number that will tell them something different. This is why it's important to be selective about when we plug in numbers and which numbers we choose to plug in. Questions that deal with certain skills are more likely to be solved with number picking. Questions dealing with number properties, so integers versus non-integers, positives versus negatives, primes, evens versus odds, divisibility, etc., are the number one best candidate for number picking. Questions dealing with exponents, inequalities, or percents and ratios are also good candidates. Now, when we do plug in numbers, it's important to choose numbers that are easy to work with. While there is an on-screen calculator, it's often inefficient, cumbersome, and limited in its capabilities. So we want to plug in as many of our numbers mentally or on scratch paper as we can. This means that there's a lot of room for error as well as for wasting time if we choose the wrong numbers. Make the math harder to mess up and faster by using small, simple numbers. Most importantly though, when plugging in numbers, we wanna pick numbers that help us answer the question, which leads us to our final point. The fourth step in beating quantitative comparison questions is asking, what's the trap on every question? There are too few questions on this test to waste any on simple, straightforward calculation. Each problem is going to have something more to it that you'll need to identify in order to solve. Now for quantitative comparison, this is mainly because of answer choice D. The relationship cannot be determined from the information given. Now this means that if A is greater than B, in every single case except one, the answer will be D, not A. Our job is to either one, find that one case, or two, prove it doesn't exist. As we mentioned earlier, this comes in the form of questioning our assumptions and testing edge cases. Assuming that a number is positive or non-zero or an integer or not insanely large or small are common mistakes that can cause us to answer A, B, or C instead of D. On the other hand, forgetting that the question stem has already ruled out some possibilities can cause us to answer D when the answer is actually A, B, or C. Just another reason to pay attention to the question stem. A good goal for these questions is to try to prove D. If you find that the quantities have a certain relationship, try to find a case in which they'll have a different one. If we're picking numbers, a good strategy is to think about categories of numbers. Oftentimes, one category of numbers will yield a certain relationship, while another category of numbers will yield another. 
Some important categories to think about testing are positive versus negative, greater than 1 versus between 0 and 1, as well as less than negative 1 versus between negative 1 and 0, even versus odd, integer versus non-integer, multiple of x versus non-multiple of x, maximum value versus minimum value, greater magnitude versus lesser magnitude compared to another number in the problem. For example, in this problem, we know that y is 8, so the denominator of quantity a is 8. We also know that x must be somewhere between 6 and 7. We want to determine whether or not x divided by 8 is greater than, less than, or equal to 0 0.85. Since we have a range of possibilities for x, we're likely thinking about maximum values versus minimum values. So here, I would plug in one low value for x, like 6.01, and one high value for x, like 6.99. Probably going to use a calculator here. In this case, a low value for x will yield a value lower than quantity b, and a high value for x will yield a value greater than quantity b. In this problem, the distance between x and 0 is 3. Right away, we likely think of x equals 3. This would give us a quantity a of 1, which is less than quantity b. However, when I see a distance problem, I think right away of positive and negative. Distance is an absolute value. This means that x may be 3 to the right of 0 or 3 to the left of 0. This leads me to test negative 3, which will give me a distance of 5, which is greater than quantity b. In general, because traps are such an integral part of this question type, know that if the answer jumps out at you right away on a quantitative comparison question, take a second to think about it, because it's likely wrong. And that's how you can beat GRE quantitative comparison questions. So to recap, quantitative comparison questions account for about 38% of quant problems. That's a lot. All quantitative comparison questions have the same structure, which tests our ability to determine the value of limited information and analyze assumptions and edge cases. We can approach these problems most effectively by giving enough attention to the question stem, manipulating the quantities, plugging in smart numbers, and asking what's the trap before committing to an answer. Thanks again for watching, and feel free to check us out at gre.prepscholar.com for more great GRE content. See you next time.